I usually have a bag and I have you reach in it and there's no telling what could be in it from just a simple non-living thing to something that's a little creepy and crawly. But I don't have anything because it was short notice. But um, have you ever paid attention to crows? Ever watched? Can you tell the difference between a crow and a raven when they're flying? One's a lot bigger, but, but sometimes it isn't noticeable. They actually fly quite differently. But crows may look a little clumsy compared to ravens, but guess who gets the worst end of the deal if a raven flies by? The raven does, because the crows actually, even though they look a little more clumsy, they can fly faster. Well, back when I was a lot younger and had no gray hairs, a little older than Jack, I, uh, I, I liked to find crow trees and get baby crows to keep as pets. And we did that a number of years. In fact, I took them to summer camp. And so the crows would be there at summer camp. And it's a little bit of a rush when you have a pet crow and you turn him free. You have to train him. You have to train him to come to your hand. Because like any baby bird, if they're hungry, they just sit there and yell. You don't, when the day comes when you're trying to train them, you don't feed him until he moves his foot at least a little bit. And then you immediately feed him. And then the next day, you don't feed him until he moves his foot, both feet. And you just keep working on that. And pretty soon, he comes to you very quickly, anytime you hold your hand. And so then comes the day when you let them go. And um, I remember running to the cafeteria at um, Camp Winnikeg. And I had a clean shirt on in the morning, and the crows had been digging around in the front yard, and their feet were all muddy. If I walked, there are places where one would land here and one would land here on my shoulder. And you learn to walk very straight because everybody bends over, and if you suddenly feel a warm spot on your back, you realized you made a bad mistake. <laughs> So, but I didn't want to get dirty, so I'd run for the cafeteria, and I'd have a crow head right here flying. I'd have a crow head right here flying, and when I got to the cafeteria, I'd run, stop like this. The crows would land on the ground, and I'd walk inside. But the reason I'm telling you about it is when you are first letting the crows out of the cage, for their first time, you get the feeling just like a parent when you're letting young people go do something for the first time, because crows do dumb things. I'm not saying kids do. You can't draw that connection, but <laughs> the crow is going and he's flying around the motorboat. He doesn't know what water is. He goes to land on it. Well, it's a nice soft landing, but he's in big trouble, and you have to have a net and fish him out. And then he's figured it out after that. But you know, that's how we are as we go through life. There are things that we have to learn, things that surprise us, things that we didn't know about, that you can drown in water for a crow. Well, there are other things. And it, it isn't just for young people. It's for us as adults. We end up having to learn things about how God works. And one of the best places to figure out when you don't know what is ahead is Proverbs 3, 5. You probably, you might know it by heart. It begins with trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Yes. What does that mean? What would that mean to me? What should it mean to me? 
um, if you trust in God, he'll help you in life. Right. When I'm starting to do a dumb thing, if I'm listening, I could have shouted at the crow, but he probably wouldn't have paid attention because he was too busy learning how to fly and he didn't know that the water was a problem. Well, as I'm going through life, sometimes I get too busy and I don't realize and I need to learn to trust in God completely. And so this story isn't just for you guys, it's for all of us. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we ask that you will help all of us to learn to trust in you always. And in all our ways, I acknowledge you and you shall direct our paths and I praise God for how you have done that in the past. And I ask that you will do it for each of us as we go forward in this life. In your holy name, amen. You can. Our scripture is from Matthew 22, verses 35 to 40. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And Jerry Kendall has our sermon today. Thank you so much, David your hope today and I'm going to move down here I think just to be closer to everybody Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. All right, I'm just going to have a quick word of prayer as we start the sermon, if you'll bow your heads. Dear Jesus, we just um, are grateful to come before you today and study your word and share it with each other, and I ask you, uh, you help me today to present it well and, and show your love for us and your message that is timeless. In Jesus' name, amen. It's nice to see everyone, especially so much of my extended family here today from California and Maine and um, everyone else that is here today. There was talk that with camp meeting there wouldn't be many people, but uh, we are. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have a couple scripture uh, readings say that I'm going to ask for volunteers for, so you can be thinking ahead for that if anyone would like to find those and maybe volunteer as we go along. Uh, they will be, uh, the very scripture reading, we'll get to that again at some point, the one that's in the bulletin. Also, uh, John 3.16, actually John 3.16 16 through 19, as well as the entire first chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, that entire chapter, the love chapter. The title of the sermon today is The One Directive. It was an indulgence of... Uh, as a kid, I liked the Star Trek show. I don't know if we have anyone else here that's experienced Star Trek or watched it, but nonetheless, they have a, a whole bunch of rules, um, like we all do, and one of them is called the Prime Directive. It's referred to often, and if you violate it, you're in lots of trouble. It's, it's kind of their, their sacred rule, 
It just means that you don't interfere with other cultures as you're exploring. We'll get back to that at the end, but that title inspired the title of the sermon, which is the only directive. Yes, there's, there's lots of subsets of it, but as my sermon will show, and as Jesus himself has said, there's only one rule uh, that God wants us to live by, and only one rule that God lives by. And let's get right into that. In contrast, we have lots of rules, don't we? Here on earth, I'm sure we can think of lots of examples. There's economic rules that sometimes we don't even see, but they apply. If you spend all your money in one place, then you don't have it for the next place. That's called opportunity cost for those of us who, for those of you who, uh, who study economics. There's political rules, certain things you need to do if you want to get ahead in politics. Lots of legal rules. Boy, there's whole, whole books I used to study in my younger days and just ways, you know, rules that we've written for ourselves to help get along in the sinful world. And there's relationship rules, there's expectations, there's, there's even rules in our church that, uh, and how we should treat each other here. And they're all written out and we've done our best. We've done our best and hopefully in those rules that we as, as mere mortals have written that they uh, emulate God's rules, the way God wants us to live. Sometimes they do, sometimes they come close, sometimes they fall short. But they're written by us. Let's go back, let's get right back into the word though. Let's go back and look at uh, what God's rules are. And that is our scripture for today. If someone could just read um, let's see where that went. Uh, Matthew 22 37 through uh, 37 through 40 again. Oh, you can read the whole thing. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Let's, uh, these are wonderful verses, and they stand by themselves, but let's, let's dig deeper and unpack Matthew 22, kind of set the stage of what led up to this. This was the Tuesday of Holy Week uh, in Jerusalem, where Jesus had come into Jerusalem for the final time. And it was only two or three days before he was to die. And of course, he knew that. And he, they'd been at it for a while. The, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the, learned, the most learned men of Israel, um, kind of challenging Jesus on the law, trying to trip him up, trying to be him on law and logic and debate. And they'd gone through many things in Matthew 22 before they got to this. And we talked about the, uh, the parable of the marriage supper and that's really the, you know, Jesus foretelling the Jews' rejection of him, and then he was calling the Gentiles as far as going out and finding uh, just anyone who would come to the marriage feast. And as they went through that, the, local, the, the people, the, the Sadducees and Pharisees challenged him, and they challenged him about the law in many ways, tribute to Caesar, resurrection, um, and so forth. And so when they go to a lawyer, this wasn't just a man in the crowd who was a lawyer by trade and was just there because he was curious and there to see Jesus. No, he was, a lawyer back then meant um, someone who's well, well versed in the scripture, the Old Testament and the traditions about, around it. So he was a lawyer in the law of God, in the, uh, the law of Moses. So he was the best they had uh, to trick up Jesus. And Jesus knew the situation and he wasn't going to be able to add to this down the road. This was, this was the end of Jesus' ar argument with the Pharisees, or not arguing, but teaching them and debating the law with them. This was his final saying on the matter. And we've read that again. I shall love the Lord with all thy heart, 
and all thy soul and all thy mind, and love thy neighbor. And that was it. Now, where did Jesus get this? Was he just making it up on the spot? Of course not. The law is consistent from the, be the beginning of uh, time until the end. It does not change. The law is love. Let's go back to the Ten Commandments. I have them here. We know them all by heart. But often, they are, they are shorthanded. Commandments 1 through 4. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make raven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Those have been shorthanded as love God. And I believe that's true. 5 through 10. Honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Shall not steal. Shall not bear false witness nor covet. These have been shorthanded, and it's true to love others. Jesus was re referring to law, and as he said, he came not to destroy the law or create new law, but to uphold it. There is a natural tension between our laws and the law of God. He wrote his, and we are mere mortals in a fallen world, and we have written ours. And the Pharisees at that point had... How many laws did they have? I've seen the number somewhere. 623, 600, some, somewhere, but 713, even more. Okay, so it's, it's growing. And they tend to, <laughs> yes, it does. And when we get a hold of laws, they tend to grow in our families, in our communities. We always come up with new ones for any situation. And we're getting, again, we do our best, but sometimes it gets farther and farther away from the essence, the true law, the only directive of love. And let's right here is where I want to be. Let's look at how God would have his law followed out. How he would have us live his law and how he would have it. How he has shown it. Getting to the real point of the sermon, love isn't just an attribute of God. Yes it is, but it's not a side one in addition to all his other attributes. Just as the sun above us is heat, is light, the nature of God, the very essence, is love. That, there, the sermon's over. We'll go a little bit farther, but that is, that is the whole point. And God's interactions with us from the beginning to the end is love applied. We start with the Garden of Eden right after creation. God created a wonderful world for us where he took care of every need. Adam and Eve did not need their own laws. They just followed God and every evening they communed with God. There was a couple laws that they needed to follow which God told them, but those were love as well. And that was God with us in Eden. Well, we know what happened there. There was... There was the fall very soon after that. We only get into Genesis a little ways, and there's the fall. And God knew that was going to happen, and he had a plan for that too. Let's go. Would someone volunteer to read? Uh, we're going to read John 3.16. We're going to go all the way to verse 19. So John, um, John chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. Yes. Thank you so much, Don. There's so much here. We know the very famous verse, and we love it. But if you go, and then if, if you look at verse 17, 
God didn't, come, didn't send his son here to condemn it. No, but to save it. Again, love again, personified. And what do we do? How do we accept this? We just believeth on him. And that's how we love him back. I love verse 19 as well, because the condemnation is that light comes into the world, but men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. That alludes to what I've been, a, a current theme that runs through all this, that when we write our own rules and try to th- think we know better than God, it's departing from him. Just like in Eden, we, uh, after the fall, we had to cover our nakedness with fig leaves. Here on earth, as we've been separated from God, we've had to write rules. And they're necessary. We, we need things. We need traffic laws. We need laws, um, day-to-day laws in every aspect of life. But they're not God's law. They're not. And a lot of times, they, they, uh, they align. But many times, they conflict. They, well, I don't need that anymore anyways. Um, but many times, our laws conflict with God's law. So we stay focused on God's law. Moving on. After, after uh, well, what John 3.16 alludes to is the cross. You know, every time I write a sermon or study for one, I can't say I've written it, but uh, prepare one, I think that the cross would be a standalone sermon, and then I'd go to other topics. But every time I do one, it comes right back to the cross. It's going to be in every sermon that I do, because I can't get away from it. That's the ultimate example of God's love for us and, and his nature uh, in action. But it's more than that. It's every day. Because after, after Jesus' life on earth, the Holy Spirit came into the picture. And we see God's love for us every day as he's with us every day, as we let the Holy Spirit come into our lives and, and guide us and, and help us through the sinful world. As we go through the book, the Bible, beginning to end, there's countless examples of God's love with his interactions with people. In fact, is if I only had five minutes or even less than that to share the gospel uh, with somebody, to share what God is, the shorthand of Jesus is life on earth. It's just his love. Every last interaction with people is Jesus' love for them. We're going to go to the rich young ruler for a second. This is another sermon on mammon, but it, this is where they cross over. Um, Mark chapter 10, I'm just doing this from memory. Mark chapter 10, I think verse 21 is where he's speaking to the rich young ruler and, and then he's about to give him the bad news uh, that he needs to sell his possessions and give to the poor because he's followed all the other rules. Notice how this falls into our theme today. But if, uh, if someone would read that verse with emphasis on the very first, the first uh, sentence of it. Oh, Mark 10, Mark 10, verse 20, uh, 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Because Jesus wanted him to be saved. More than anything, Jesus wasn't teaching him rules just to be mean to him or to control him, but Jesus loved him and wanted him to accept God's love. And to do that, you have to radiate it back outwards and love others. And Jesus knew that the rich young ruler loved money more than God, and you can have nothing between you and God. That's the concept of mammon, but uh, that's for another day. Throughout the Bible, we see constant interactions in God's uh, love for each person in front of him. The patience he had with David, there's endless examples. But I believe there's another book that been written, a personal book for each one of us, the 67th one of our personal Bible, and that's God's interaction with each one of us every day. We see his love every moment in his care for us, his guidance of us, and his endless patience and hope for us. So what are we to do? God calls us in these, in, uh, to love, our, love him and love our neighbor as ourselves. Well, how do we, what does that mean? We love our families, a, a, um, a strong emotional bond, 
Uh, there's many words for love in the Bible, eros, phila, uh, agape. But in this context, what it really means is how we treat others, a choice. The patience, the generosity, to love God with our, our heart and mind, uh, things, it's hard as an emotion. What it really means is to let him into our hearts, to, to spend time with him, to surrender to him, and turn the, turn the, uh, the controls over to him, to, to choose God every moment. That is to love God, is to be one with him. And once we do that, it would be hard if, if we really were to force ourselves and say, okay, I've got to follow this commandment to be saved. Uh, and so I'm going to really force myself every day to love my neighbor as myself, and it's going to be really hard. We could, force, we could do it for a little while, but now we'd fail it miserably like I do all the time. Um, but no, once we choose God and let him in, surrender to him, and let him take control of our lives, then we radiate Christ's love to others. It's not us that's going to love others. It's God in us. And that's going... So following Jesus, following his example, following his, uh, his teachings, and letting him into our heart every day, that's how we love our neighbors as ourselves. And it just takes practice every day. And who would like to help me with 1 Corinthians 13. This is, I have the King James Version in front of me. Growing up with that, that's kind of my go-to. And they have the, uh, this is the love chapter. They use the word charity a lot. Whoever reads it probably could substitute the word love in there just to uh, be apropos to today's sermon. Anyone? Uh, I'm sorry. Was, anyone could read 1 Corinthians 13 for me? Though I speak with the tongue of the tongues of men and the angels, and not charity, I have become as sounding brass or a single symbol. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I have to give my body to be burned and have not charity, it, it promises me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity and then you have not. And you tell me to say love. love Either one. Um, okay. Love contains not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly. And it's not easy to vote for the evil. Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Bear all things, believe all things, hope in all things, endure all things. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they have uh, um, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, they shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But we, that which is perfect, is come. Then, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am. Thanks so much, Kathy. Yeah, I think that really sums it up well. What uh, you know, Paul's letters to the Corinthians. What a guidebook for how we should live here on earth. And I, I've always loved verse twelve. For now, as we see through a glass darkly, it's not perfect. We live in a sinful world that has fallen, and. We have so many rules that we see every day, and we need, we need to see that separation. We need to distill them, 
We need to separate the wheat from the chaff as we live and keep our eyes on Jesus so that we follow his law every moment. Getting back to uh, getting back to Jesus with the scribes and Pharisees, there's an interesting um, part to the story. I always like to study this more. I, I always find that I learn more in these sermons than uh, I ever knew before, you know, I think I learned the most from these sermons than anyone does. This was towards the end of the chapter. They had been um, testing Jesus throughout uh, these last few chapters of Matthew and, and arguing with him. But this was the very end of the legal discussion or the conflict between our rules and his. Note that natural conflict. No one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day onward did anyone dare question him anymore. Their silence was a tribute. And they got up and left. This was the end of the learned men of Israel trying to tear down Jesus on legal grounds. From that day forward, uh, his enemies would use treachery and violence instead. So right after this, they didn't like this conversation, they didn't like um, what Jesus said because it conflicted so much with them and their beloved rules. And so actually right after he made uh, the statement, they started plotting how to get rid of him and started how to kidnap him and try him at night and make up charges against him. And they did. But the interesting thing is they still could not even do that. Just a, a side note, which doesn't matter as much as this sermon, but what finally put Jesus to death? It was his own words, those two words, thou sayest. When he had, when, and it's the only time he ever claimed to be the Son of God because they asked him, and he, he, he knew that to fulfill the scriptures, um, he said, thou sayest, when he was on trial. And that's what put him to death. So he won that argument, too. And he did it on his own terms. Well, let's go back to Star Trek, where we started the sermon. Last night, uh, Kenzie and I, went out in the field and, and uh, for a midnight four-wheel ride, or it wasn't midnight, but it looked like it, looked at the stars and the moons, uh, the moon out there, and it's just a passion of mine. Ever since I was a kid, my dad shared that with me a lot. Uh, when I was little, I'm hoping to pass it along to her. And maybe that's why I love Star Trek, the fact that they're out there in the stars. In fact, there's even one of the Star Trek um, movies. I didn't really care for it because it, you know, with my background, but they actually we're supposed to voyage to the center of the galaxy and actually find God to, to break into God's space, and it didn't work out. Uh, it, it was just a false journey. But nonetheless, um, Star Trek is, is the dream of voyaging beyond this world. Well, we don't need a spaceship, and we don't need to go track God down. All we have to do is let him in. He's right here in this room, and his law, the law of love, transports us to that other world, that world that's beyond here, beyond our sinful life, beyond the fallen world. And let's us see God and meet him and live like him every day just by following his directive of love. Our closing hymn today is number 290, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I invite everyone to help me sing. I do not do well with that myself, but uh, I will rely on everyone else here to do a better job than I.
please bow your heads.